Thank you. It's always nice to get a bit of a round of applause before you've said anything, so you might not feel like it afterwards. Um, I am uh, Tena Katoa. I am uh, Nicola Wien. I'm from the University of Otago, where I have been teaching environmental law, public law, and international environmental law for a bit too long. Um, it's always a bit disturbing looking around rooms like this and seeing all your former students all grown up and being real people. So. Yeah. So today we are uh, talking about public health as a driver for uh, predominantly urban planning. Um, and we have two uh, great speakers to speak to you today. So my plan is to say a little bit about what we're going to do. Um, and then I will introduce the first of the speakers. Um, she will then speak. Um, and then I will introduce the second. Uh, so that's the, that's the plan that, that we'll use here. Right, so talking about public health is um, a sort of personal, uh, private and, and public kind of enterprise, but of course it's been happening a, a great deal more um, in environmental management, environmental planning, environmental law. Uh, we see it perhaps in uh, the growth of the idea of a human right to a healthy environment, but we also see it in documents like uh, those that emanated from the Rio Plus conference in uh, Rio de Janeiro. Um, where we see a focus on health as a precondition for social, economic and ecological um, sustainability being well talked about. So in this session we are focusing on that issue of uh, public health as a driver for environmental planning. We might want to ask ourselves, I suppose, as uh, resource management um, practitioners of one kind or another, uh, whether we think that health should be a driver um, under the Resource Management Act, whether it is in fact that already, uh, whether the Resource Management Act supports or even accommodates this kind of approach, um, what some of the issues and challenges uh, might be um, that we might face um, or enjoy uh, resolving if we're to tread this path. So our first uh, speaker today is Professor Philippa Howden Chapman. Uh, professor Howden Chapman is, is a professor of public health at the University of Otago. She's at the Wellington campus. She is also the director of He Kainga Oranga, the Housing and Health Research Program, and the New Zealand Centre for Sustainable Cities. She has conducted a number of randomised community housing trials in partnership with local communities. Um, and these have had a major influence on housing, health and energy policy in New Zealand. She's currently the chair of the World Health Organization Housing and Health Guideline Development Group um, and was a member of the Children's Commissioner's Expert Advisory Group on Solutions to Child Poverty. Um, today, Professor Howden Chapman will talk for about 30 minutes um, on her reflections um, and her work in trying to promote the use of public health as a driver for urban planning. Tēnā koutou katoa, tēnā koe ki te iwi o Takao, Naitahu, ki ora ki koutou te kōpapa te kene ki tēnā wā. Thank you very much for asking an outsider <laughs> to a, a law conference. Um, and it's been, I found it a fascinating experience so far, so I hope being on the boundaries with some intersection with your work, you'll find what I have to say interesting. So I'm going to talk about how public health um, both is, affects um, urban planning and particularly the built environment. I'm um, look, presenting the view that we've had this work, idea of what the frameworks are and what, the, what is the linkage between um, some of the effects work under the Resource Management Act and I'm going to talk about the work, the way that we've conceptualised the urban system, linking housing, transport and energy. Uh, and as I intimated before, public health is both a driver and an outcome of urban planning. So I think it's very timely that we think as the Resource Management Act is being reviewed and we put in a submission about that, which I can send anyone who's interested. Um, and this morning we heard about how the idea of conflicts between one, as, one 
um, perspective on another can be superseded by the idea of conversation and discourse. We've been working in the space of co-benefits, thinking not of trade-offs, but what of the um, what, where can we um, outline that by doing this there are advantages in other areas? And in particular in the area of transit-oriented development, that is um, building more intensified housing along public transport routes. And active journeys, getting out of the car, walking, cycling more, or walking to the bus. And then raise the issue, which I know most of you know much more about than me, of the National Policy Statement for Urban Development. Okay, so to remind you about the importance of urban health, um, the built environment um, affects health globally, and the first set of figures are from the WHO internationally. The issue of outdoor air pollution, over three million deaths a year, and some of you will just have seen that they've just actually upgrade, um, raised the number of deaths that they are attributable to uh, um, air pollution, um, because we now know that the nanoparticles go from your lungs actually into your heart, and so the burden of disease from outdoor air pollution, whether it's in Shanghai, Delhi, or Paris, is much higher than was originally thought. But physical inactivity, and the report has just come out um, on the costs of physical activity, inactivity in New Zealand. Um, half the population in New Zealand doesn't get the level of recommended exercise, and we think that that's about 1.2 billion a year in cost there. And then there's the whole issue of traffic injuries, largely from cars, which never gets factored into those cost-benefit analyses that we see that driving policy at the moment. And then the issue of climate change, which of course is on a, a very rapid trajectory to get much worse, estimated about 140,000 deaths a year. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with public health, except in passing, I thought I'd just remind you how it differs from clinical medicine. So public health is focused on population health rather than individual effects. It emphasizes broad determinants of health, and in general, people are concentrating on things like income and wealth, uh, housing and employment. But in our um, Center for Sustainable Cities, we've been concentrating on the built environment and urban issues. Uh, there's a real importance um, of concentrating on public goods, of course, which the Commons was a very famous, is a very famous example of. And these are non-excludable. If I go and walk, work, walk in the Commons, if I go and walk in the park, um, it doesn't stop you going in too. And non-rival, uh, largely public spaces, and these are amenities to social inclusion. And we think this is a very, very important um, part of what makes our cities healthy to live in. Uh, and we know public goods are underprovided by the market um, because you can't make a profit from public goods. And when we come, when I come at the end to discuss very briefly social housing, that is one of the problems there. Nobody's interested in building public housing, low cost, affordable housing, because you don't make as much profit building a 100 square meter house as you do in a 300 square meter house. I uh, just come back from working at the WHO in Switzerland, and this was a little park nearby with children running in and out. It's a really good example, I think, of a public good. Um, and it, it's, everyone went there, lots and lots of people went there morning, noon, and night, and so there was less chance of um, people feeling disenfranchised in the city, the anami that um, I'm a great collector of graffiti, so uh, I thought this was a great one. Um, and of course, you can, uh, cities can be socially inclusive or they can, be, they can exclude people and by actually the built environment. And here's an example coming from The Guardian of which we see stopping young people doing skateboarding around the cities, but putting spikes on the edge of places where you might rest your feet for a while and particularly to stop people sleeping overnight. Uh, and how hostile architecture keeps the unwanted away. And we're starting to see a bit of this in our cities. So um, why would public health converge on the issue of urban planning? Well, 87% of New Zealanders lived in towns and cities. By some accounts, we're one of the most urbanized countries in the world. Uh, intensified at inner city housing, which is close to public transport and cycling, um, makes these active journeys the easy choice. And that's what we're wanting to do, not persuade people to um, harangue them to, um, 
to, to live in different ways, but to make it much easier just to walk down to the local bus stop than get in a car and drive to work and then drive round and round trying to find a car park. Um, we know that carbon emissions, um, which of course we've got to dramatically try and reduce, as Obama said, we're the last generation that can, um, are substantially generated by the construction sector and transport, both of which of course converge in the cities. And the housing transport link is a very important one. And it's one of the submissions that we made about the special housing accords. If they're outside the metropolitan urban limits, and supposedly the houses are cheaper out there, and you have to get in your car and drive in, uh, to the central city where you wor work, um, that is not the co combination of the two, your housing costs and your transport costs, do not that make that an uh, uh, affordable option for many people. And we know from our work when as soon as interest rates go up and the price of petrol goes up, then the mortgagee sales are always on the outer areas of the city. So we have to be starting to think about things in interaction. And we know that um, central city residents emit less carbon than their suburban counterparts. Oh. Uh, now, there are a set of urban design protocols which have been somewhat muted after, um, in, in the last while, but a very important set of principles that people like us and councils and companies sign up to. And they, I think, are very important to remember because many of these things that we know from our work in public health enhance population health. Uh, the place, the respect and support for local character, uh, promotion of higher density, mixed-use neighbourhoods and spaces adapted to changing uh, and making sure that there's lots of green space in that, that people have access to quality um, public areas and particularly that idea that there should be participation in the urban design process so people don't feel excluded and we've heard um, very eloquently this morning about how iwi have often felt um, seen to be um, stakeholders rather than partners. Decision making has to be integrated between and with orga within organisations. And I think it's really interesting that in a largely new Liberal government, we've got a concentration of power um, increasingly in the centre, which I think is very interesting. Um, economic, social, environmental, cultural, cultural policies complement one another. And I think that even if we don't talk the language of sustainability, it's a really important to think about the synergies between these aspects. Um, a really nice public walk um, in one of my travels. Um, so just to highlight, because I think this is one of the most important aspects of my um, discussion, that really this integration, both in densities and compactness with transport, the integration in schools and green spaces, and that emphasis on walking and cycling are absolutely critical. To give you some examples of how far we're falling behind, I think, in New Zealand, this is transit-oriented development in Strasbourg, France. Cafes all around, people come out, get onto the light rail uh, and go wherever they might want to or they walk around. Another one in Bern, this is a UNESCO city in Switzerland, so built in the 18th century, but they still put a light rail through it. Cycling goes very slowly, uses its bell a lot to let you know that it's coming. Uh, and the kind of housing that you see in much of European cities. Now when we come to New Zealand, this is a famous photo many of you might recognise from Marty Freelander, uh, that uh, we built, a lot of our industrial type state housing was built um, around the cars and this is in East Porirua and it's actually very difficult to walk from one end of it to the other because it's very curling cul-de-sacs. Uh, whereas the modernist movement early on built lots of state ha uh, council housings in that period when the state, the national government passed over to the city councils the responsibility for housing. And we were, the Second World War had one um, beneficial effect from New Zealand. Lots of those Austrian and German Bauhaus ar architects came over to New Zealand. And with the refurbishment result of negotiations with the previous government, 220 million, the infrastructure of the city council buildings is wonderful now uh, in Wellington. And we're really 
really now the only council, given the Christchurch earthquake, that has a large stock of council housing. And it was placed alongside public transport, so it's very easy to actually um, get around Wellington to the railway station and then out to the suburbs. Um, of course, we've got this issue about the relationship between different agencies. I noticed the New Zealand Transport Agency, which has a very important role, um, uh, is sponsoring your um, um, conference. And um, there's, of course, a case in um, Wellington, uh, just in the paper before I left, that the um, New Zealand Transport Agency is going to announce that they're going to... Um, uh, they're going to fight, or try and overturn the decision um, of the, um, sorry. Uh, who are the people who do it? Uh, set up a board of inquiry, sorry, the board of inquiry. Uh, and um, uh, the, from a public health point of view, and we put in several submissions about this, uh, roading to the board of inquiry, increased investment in roading ignores the trends in declining use by the young. It, ex it has, gives certainty to a scenario which is actually um, very weak, uh, and it overlooks the opportunity costs um, making urban severance across the area where the largest number of people walk to work and school in Wellington of any city in the southern hemisphere and you have to wait rain, um, hail or snow uh, to cross those roads for usually two or three minutes. Lack of investment in walking and cycling. So that's an issue I think that we really need to address um, rapidly. And just to work from somebody in my group, this is going to be a bit hard to see, but on the right there, um, we've looked at um, various uh, territorial local authorities um, graded by um, uh, whether they are uh, highly socioeconomically deprived, in which case they're um, counted as poor, and the red, uh, the, the green is um, middle and the rich is blue. And this you can see that what usually happens to these roads, they're put through poor areas. Actually, there's no pointer here. Um, but you can see here, uh, this is the areas, these areas that get the most traffic through them, and you can see almost invariably, it's except with the, actually Wellington is an exception to this, um, that the, the roads go through the poorer areas where they're already more likely to be um, um, exceedances of air pollution. So there's a really important equity issue here about how we organise our cities. Um, this comes from London, um, where in parallel to the Euston Road, they've got a very nice um, cycle route that takes you so cyclists don't have to go on the very busy road, and it's an area where the kids hang out after school, really nice space. Um, we've done some work on um, local preferences and uh, book sizing up the city. Uh, and we used a shape New Zealand sample. It's not random, but it's weighted to be like the New Zealand um, population. And we surveyed people about these issues that we hear a lot about, about um, people um, implying what New Zealanders think, and we thought we'd get some data, and we now have ongoing work on this. So we asked people about urban sprawl, urban limits, and where they would like to live. And you can see this is about limits, that we asked them the question, uh, urban limits are necessary so that cities can develop more sustainably, they had a choice of that, or B was urban limits are unnecessary and they limit city development. And you can see that most people replied that they accepted metropolitan urban limits over half the people as being very important. We didn't frame this as public health or and then we're just asking them questions about this city. We asked them who should control the urban form, and the first um, um, choice that they had was council should have the uh, key role in defining the form of the city, or market forces should have the key role. Now obviously that's a forced choice and you would expect um, a mixture to some extent between the two, which is what the gr last group um, thought. But again, the majority of people um, thought that the council should have a critical role there. And finally, to accessibility of living location, and asked where uh, would you prefer to live within walking or cycling distance of some of the uh, destinations you need to go to, like shop, shopping, work, parks, schools, and transit stops. Again, most people said yes, they would value that. And this is what um, I think we are in a sense building for the past in um, New Zealand, um, so that 
people actually want to be close to where action is. And there's a very strong demographic in here, young people and older people, uh, middle-aged people, really wanted to live in the inner city. The only group that favoured being out in the suburbs was ch people with children. So I think there's a really important that we take the example of um, green space. I was lucky enough to go on an MB trip um, around um, Europe looking at different kinds of um, ways cities are organised. And this phrase came up, unexpected green. It lifts people's spirit in a, a city to go and uh, look at for green. It has amenity value, psychological value and environmental value. This was the green wall um, in Paris and right Right in the middle there, you can see a window, two or three windows. Um, it would be lovely to see some of these around our cities. Uh, this was in Clerkenwell, just a little space where you could go at lunchtime um, to have lunch. And um, some really nice green graffiti. Uh, <laughs> uh, now, I just want to um, finish by talking some about uh, some of our housing work that we've done. New Zealand has a big problem with very poor housing. 1,600 people die each year in excess in winter. And these are not just people who are going to die a month later um, because we can track that and see. This doesn't occur in Siberia, Canada, uh, or, or Scandinavia. And this is much more than people who die in, from air pollution or in road traffic accidents. Uh, one of my doctoral students worked with Stats New Zealand last year looking at people who were in insecure housing, crowded, uh, had no security of tenure, and it's 34,000 people. And this has come out as official Stats New Zealand report. And these are predominantly children and young adults. Uh, ethnic minorities and people in um, parent families. Now we calculate you'll need between 12 to 20,000 dwellings there to house these people in decent uh, houses. Uh, this is, we're not doing that. We've, uh, we've, um, uh, we're very excited and somewhat proud to say we've, we've enthused a whole group of medical students, um, medical students for global awareness, and they did this wonderful bit of theatre in our local mall called Operation Housing, um, where they, um, because many of them have to deal with the children who come in with the results of childhood pneumonia, respiratory conditions, and so they were highlighting that um, actually, it was quite moving. This child died, and they were pointing out that 70% of children in poverty live in rental housing for which there is no regulation. We've developed a healthy uh, home index, and with the New Zealand Green Building Council, we've now developed a rental housing index. Uh, we uh, combined efforts with five councils, including Dunedin, Wellington, Christchurch, and uh, Tauranga, and, and Dunedin. And we pre tested these, um, uh, went to, we trained up the assessors, and when we, we this is a pre-test with um, going in, looking at the housing, seeing if it meets basic standards, um, but ones that we know that have a major impact on health. There's about 30 of them. We interviewed then the tenants, the landlords and the assessors, and they were generally very positive. And this is a pilot study of what we hope is a rollout. This is an area where there's a lot of public interest, um, but we found, it, um, a, 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 we found it difficult to get engagement with the Minister of Housing, uh, although we have met with him several times. Uh, and I think this is one of the area where um, health effects are actually very critical. Uh, another area we've looked a lot at is um, uh, the issue of leaky buildings, the lack of regulation in housing in the 90s, and I don't think just in the 90s. Um, one, of our, one of our famous, infamous experiments in deregulation, where we changed building materials, contracting arrangements, training and regulation estimated by Deloitte to could be costing us, going to cost us, remember it's not settled, 22 billion, and so it's almost as expensive as the Christchurch earthquake. But do you hear about it? I, I was asked by Thomson Reuters to write a chapter um, with a um, public health lawyer, Christopher Ruth, um, about um, what, where, have the lessons been learned? And I have to say that it was a resounding no was the answer. So then when we come to Christchurch, finally, and I apologise to those of you who are Christchurch, I always feel a bit um, um, fokamar about thinking about whether I should show this photo because this is taken just a minute after the earthquake occurred in Christchurch. Uh, and I've been there a lot for housing issues, and I thought this was a very telling bit of 
graffiti, get your head out of the sand, there is a housing crisis. Um, and there's a wonderful group of um, young people who, despite young people all supposed to be about social media, actually raised 65,000 and wrote this book, which they've got Helen Clark writing in the forefront of, and 55 authors. And um, we wrote a chapter on inverse care law with Stats New Zealand, or a senior policy analyst from Stats New Zealand. And the scale of our, the scale of lack of concentration on building affordable housing in Christchurch, I think, is truly scandalous. Um, uh, so it's all very well to have anchor projects, which are supposed to lift the spirits, but if you're in your fourth winter, still in a damaged house, um, that's not very good for public health. Uh, and so, uh, it, given how centralized power is in Christchurch, it's very, um, this is a, I think this is a really extraordinary situation that we're in, and I wonder how many more winters these people are having to go through. There were 100,000 homes damaged. There are now 11,000 fewer houses, um, and, and so on. Um, the number of rental properties has fallen by 19%. There's a big increase in crowding. Rents have doubled over the rate of inflation. Now, this is Christchurch rebuild, of course, is very good for our GDP, but it's not good for the people whose housings are, have been damaged. And of course, if you didn't insure your house, if you were struggling to heat or to eat, um, you don't pay your insurance. And if you don't pay your insurance, you don't get any EQC payments. So um, that, um, that means that there are a number of people who are in a really parlous state financially. And there's little provision of permanent, affordable housing, for, particularly for displaced people or, um, or for disabled people. And so this is a real problem, and it links, so we've got problem with, um, we need to link transport with, with housing more. We need to think about different ways of um, building houses, and we need to think about improving the quality of our existing houses, because we have very old, cold houses, largest in the um, lowest energy use in the OECD, and we usually only heat one room of our house. Um, we've done a number, we've done six studies now, but the first one was this housing insulation and health study where we worked with 1,400 um, families and seven different communities. Um, uh, we worked with Tuhoi, we worked with right a branch of the Maori Women's Welfare League, Christchurch, and, and so on, around, uh, uh, eight communities in New Zealand. And we insulated the um, houses. Everybody collected data for us, then we randomly insulated half of them, went back the next winter, and then insulated the other houses at the end. And um, my husband, Rafe Chapman, who's the environmental economist, is in the audience, and he did this um, cost-benefit analysis um, showing almost two to one benefit of a cost and net present benefits. If you look at all the social benefits of actually improving existing housing, and I think we, um, while the government, um, both local and central government, are supposed to look at the social costs of what happens, all too often there's a premium given on how fast you can get across the city. Uh, and so I think we need to we need to really be putting a lot of emphasis on what about the tangible and intangible benefits and costs of things that we do. We, we subsequently worked with Arthur Grimes, I subsequently worked with Arthur Grimes of Motu at the rollout of the Warm Up New Zealand program, which this formed the basis of, and we looked at the results of 45,000 houses, and there we could get look at um, uh, hospital and mortality data, and we found that it was a four to one benefit uh, benefits over costs, and for children it was a six to one benefit over costs. So these are very um, simple things that we can actually really provide a good evidence base for. Um, the funding for this is stopping, and it's going to be all allocated in 2015, so I would urge you to help us to keep it going has multiple benefits. And this is the, the last idea I wanted to raise, this idea of co-benefits, that one doesn't have to have conflict. This was, there was a lot of um, publicity about how this provided not just employment, it provided um, the, the very strong organizations for local groups and lots of health benefits. 
Now, finally, just as an introduction to um, the next speaker, I just wanted to say the importance of social housing. I less, just to remind you that less than 5% of houses in New Zealand are social housing. These are low levels internationally. It's 18% in Britain. The Liberal government began building them initially at the turn of the last century, but they were too far out from where people had to work and they weren't very popular. The early state housing was integrated with amenities. There were some papakaiang or examples around Whaifatu of Te Atiawa, uh, uh, or village greens in, in um, more European settlements. And they, were, they had amenities nearby, transport, housing, uh, but the later state housing was very industrial, even though for the people involved, as Ben Schrader's book says, they called it home. And the, 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 what, I'm, what I consider the partial asset sales of state housing, um, I think is a very, very big experiment. And for one thing, nobody is monitoring what happens to the people who are encouraged to exercise choice and get into the private rental market because we know very clearly from our work of 5,000 houses and also from the work of brands, private rentals are in on average in much worse condition than social housing, which is in poorer condition than homes that are owned. You wouldn't think that actually if you um, listened to the discourse in the government. Private rental tenure has little security, poor standards, and no heating is required. You just have to have a plug in the wall. Uh, and I'm a very firm believer that although th this is private housing, but it has public consequences because these are the children, the, the children in these families are likely to come into the hospitals. Um, now, we know that Housing New Zealand is no longer as a social housing provider, it's an asset manager, and I've worked, I have worked very closely with Housing New Zealand, have a great admirer of a lot of things that they do. Um, but this is the, their directive now. And of course, the land um, that many of these houses are on are much more valuable than the actual housing. And th the diversity of community providers, I think, is a positive. Um, but partial privatization under the rubric of mixed development, I find um, um, concerning. Increased um, tenuous insecurity leads to increasing residential and mobility through schools. I think this is the the answer as to why we have a long tail of performance in education and schools, because these children are moving uh, every once or twice every year and moving from school to school. So of course they can't, and they and their parents can't engage with the school. We've shown in our healthy housing program, when in the former era of Housing New Zealand, when they work with the district health boards, um, that the hospitalisation fell 27% a year, and for the children, there was a two-thirds drop in hospitalisation. We know that improving health and increasing stability is good for children and their families, and is very good for the economy too. It's terrible having this as the second to last slide. But we, in, in our group, we do lots of work on um, indigenous urban design, of course. Um, Māori were here in the, uh, what have become the cities before anyone else. And we're looking at, uh, in our urban planning work, on the, the appropriateness of kāinga and pā um, to urban containment. And I think the, um, the, 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 this is a very important and interesting area in New Zealand. So in conclusion, um, urban planning has a profound effect on public health and carbon emissions available uh, and it provides some examples of where we can get very good solutions um, for housing and transport and I really think that there's a need for a national urban policy statement to guide the RMA. I know that there was some of you may have been involved in getting the one going before which never quite saw the light of day. Uh, I think that's really important. As was mentioned I'm chair of the group developing guidelines for housing and health, which will bring in um, guidelines like underpin the equality standards, the, these will underpin housing. Uh, and, and, and finally, I should just let those of you who haven't noticed that there is a challenge 11 um, the government has announced. We're very pleased. We weren't sure that it was going to go through. It's the last one called Building Homes, Towns and Cities. And I think it would be really nice if we could join some of the strands about conversations, about role of iwi, um, thinking of some of these integrated policy solutions, working with communities, and involve a legal perspective in that too. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Professor Hilton Chapman. Um, I found myself uh, going up and down um, in my mind while you were talking. I was pleased that people knew what was good for them. Um, I'm really impressed by the work of um, He Kaing Oranga. Um, and obviously it's been making a significant contribution, um, but obviously there are sad um, and unhappy, uncomfortable parts of the of the story as well. Um, on reflection, I think that um, most of what we uh, are looking at with this sort of issue is um, a substantive issue, uh, outcomes and drivers, um, how these uh, public health goals need to be part of what we're doing in, in urban planning and how we can make that happen. Um, and I think our next speaker, our next panelist is looking what I would describe as a more uh, procedural angle on things. I'm, again, I suppose the public lawyer in me is coming out and dividing up the world into, into binaries. Um, so it was, you've either got to be substantive or procedural around here. Okay, so I think Martin is, is more on the procedural. I have one very important thing to say about him before I introduce him, and that is that I've just noticed that he's a lefty. I don't mean that he is, I'm not, I wouldn't bear to comment on his, think to comment on his political inclinations, because I haven't met those, but I note that he's using his left hand to write with. Um, so I would like to join in a moment of solidarity there with Martin, um, and when one for any other lefty. Uh, in the room. Right, okay, so uh, Martin Newdale uh, has extensive experience in commercial and residential property development um, and investment in the United Kingdom, Australia and New Zealand. He came to New Zealand in 2003 but had previously spent um, more than 20 years working in the Australian property markets in senior management roles. Um, as a property professional today, Martin's interests lie in business and the provision of strategic advice uh, to public and private sector clients. Um, and in that, he's focusing on the creation of enduring places based on strong design principles um, and also with a little bit of commercial reality in there. Uh, Martin was CEO of McConnell Property Limited from 2013 to 2000, 2003, sorry, to 2009, um, and in that role uh, led a well-regarded business operating in both uh, commercial and residential sectors. Uh, today, he holds numerous board and governance roles. I won't tell you about them all, um, but primarily he was the inaugural chair and is now the director of the Tamaki Redevelopment Company. Uh, and today, he will be talking about the work of the redevelopment company, its experience with its uh, redevelopment or regeneration uh, program project. Um, and as I say, in that, I think taking uh, a more... Uh, public health through process um, kind of approach. So, Martin. Thank you all for um, inviting me here today. I feel a bit like Daniel before the lines, um, being neither a planner nor a lawyer, but a reformed developer in front of a room full of planners and lawyers. But um, Tamaki's um, something that uh, I'm passionate about and um, and the urban renewal and community regeneration of many of the places um, in our cities today in New Zealand is something that we as a country are starting to have to face up with. Um, Tambaki Re Regeneration is a project that's fundamentally about well-being and lifting the living standards of the people who live there now and the people who will live and work there in the future. Community well-being is probably the single organising idea around which we seek to organise everything we do now and all the things that we will endeavour to achieve over the next 25 years with a myriad of partners. Um, I won't speak to you today um, in full about what Tamaki Regeneration is about, but I will focus um, a little bit about um, some of the stuff we're doing in the housing space and in the neighbourhood redevelopment space. Um, first up, because I know there's quite a lot of you who don't know very much about Tamaki if you don't come from Auckland and you don't wake up and think about it any, every day. But Tamaki is New Zealand's first serious attempt at large-scale um, urban and community renewal. Um, it encompasses um, the suburbs of Glen Innes, Point England and Panmuir in the east of Auckland. It's first and foremost a regeneration project it's not a housing project. I'd say an aside that um, up until about um, 
five minutes before the shareholders agreement that was signed, that was set up, uh, that set up the company. It was called the Tamaki Regeneration Company, but I don't think the minister of the time could get his head around what regeneration was, and he knew that redevelopment meant building houses. Um, so it's a personal mission of mine to change the name sometime soon. Um, regeneration at its heart encompasses economic, social and spatial change. It includes um, environmental change um, implicitly within that. Um, it's about changing the social and economic opportunities available to the current and future community of Tamaki. For me, it's about moving people from a state of dependence to one of independence and from a position where they have no choice or few choices to a position where they have an abundance of choices. It's about generational change. This stuff takes a long time, but it must also deal with the here and now. It's about the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, the catch fence at the top of the cliff, and the wellbeing centre at the beginning of life. And all of those things we need to do together and at the same time. Tamaki regeneration um, encompasses about 880 hectares of land. Um, roughly half of that's in public ownership um, between roads, Housing New Zealand, parks and all sorts of other things. And of that, about 300 hectares is residential land. There's a bit over 5,000 existing dwellings there and more than half of those are Housing New Zealand homes. Um, the majority of those um, are acknowledged as in poor condition and I guess there's a fine balance between wanting to um, change an area but also ensure that um, for a long period of time that those houses are fit for purpose um, and many of them are not. Um, only around 25% of the current housing stock in Tamaki of the 5,000 houses are owner occupied. Um, over the next 25 years in the housing space, um, it's planned, among other things, to um, double the number of dwellings um, in the area. And part of that's about um, you know, responding to the challenges um, that Auckland has in terms of growth. Um, but it's not about moving people out of the area. Um, it's about giving people the tools and opportunities to stay in the area and grow. Um, clearly, the current high percentage of social housing um, only exacerbates um, a number of social and economic challenges. We know that a mixed tenure, place-based, place-making lens coupled with a strong social and economic program is needed and it's that that will make a difference. Um, Tamaki scores bright red 10 out of 10 on every item in the social deprivation index. If you look up the uh, 2013 social deprivation index, it glows. Um, but sadly, um, perhaps more damningly for all of us in New Zealand is nothing's changed in 15 years. It is one of Auckland's and one of the country's most disadvantaged communities. Unemployment is twice that of the Auckland average. People holding a formal qualification is less than half of that of, of the Auckland average. Less than 50% of the people have a personal income more than 20%. We spend more than a million dollars a week in benefits in Tamaki and there was a report done in 2009 at the time of the Tamaki Transformation Program that suggested that the total cost um, of Tamaki per capita was twice the national average and that piece that was twice the national average at the time was $72 million. So post GFC, I'd hazard a guess that if that work was done again it would be $100 million a year. So even if you're an economic dry, and there's probably not too many of them in this room, regeneration makes sense. And we also know that if left to its own devices, it won't get better of its own accord, it'll only get worse. It's a young, diverse community. There's 16,000 people there now, around, um, sorry, I lost my point. So, so there's lots of challenges. Um, I don't need to go on listing more of them. Ironically, um, for those of you from Auckland, you will know that Tamaki is located to probably the most well-endowed and most prosperous community in the country. One day when you've got some time, catch the train from Britomart, go to Oraki Station, stay on the train and go to GI. 
On the way on that journey, you will go through a tunnel. It takes about 12 seconds to get through that tunnel. On one side of the tunnel is the most prosperous and well-endowed community in the country. On the other side of that tunnel is the least prosperous and least endowed community in the country, or perhaps one of them anyway. So you can appreciate, whilst there are many challenges, there are also substantial opportunities that we can realise through intentional intervention and by working with the people who are there. The cultural, social and economic potential of Tamaki is unique um, in many ways. Um, for me, it's a microcosm of the future of Auckland and possibly the future of New Zealand. Its geographic and strategic position make it an important part of, of Auckland's future prosperity. It's a large piece of land, it's highly connected, it's a fabulous natural environment, and it's only 12 minutes from the CBD. So it's the sort of urban renewal we need, and according to the Auckland plan, it's the sort of development we want. Um, if we don't address the challenges of Tamaki and the, and the challenges of other areas like Tamaki in Auckland and around the country, it will only drag on Auckland's growth and Auckland's potential and the country's potential. We can't afford not to do this. It's clear that traditional models of taxpayer and rate, ratepayer support have not worked. Um, in the past, the rules of government have not rewarded collaborative effort. In fact, they've punished it and this must change, and we are seeing signs of that occurring, and interestingly, much of that drives coming out of Treasury. The formation of the Tamaki Redevelopment Company between the Crown and Council signalled a new intention by those parties to move ahead with urban regeneration at pace, and many of you would know that Tamaki regeneration has been around a long time um, through many iterations um, with very little happening. Um, so uh, this was um, a signal that things would happen. It's a test bed not only for um, the organisational structures, but it's also a test bed for the planning structures and the process structures for other regeneration opportunities in New Zealand. And that's an implicit, explicit part of our mandate from both the Crown and Council shareholders that they expect us to trial new things and develop new ways of doing things that can be transported elsewhere. Regeneration um, is not about how many houses you build. Um, it involves taking an integrated whole of community and whole of resource approach by delivering long lasting improvements in the economic, physical and social well-being of the people who live there now and the people who will live there in the future. And I'm minded of much of the conversation in the opening um, address yesterday, which seemed to me to focus on many of those things. And we need to get away from process and need to get focused and organised around outcomes. And that's part of TRC's role. It requires a very high level and commitment for ongoing engagement that's about taking the community on a journey to ensure the necessary and mutual respect, trust and buy-in is present in everything we do and all the things that we our community and other stakeholders do together. For us, it's about obtaining and holding a social licence to operate. For a number of reasons, um, there was a high level of mistrust, a high level of scepticism in the community, um, and you'd have to say that's hardly surprising been, uh, what that community has been through. So the social licence to operate is very hard to get and incredibly easy to lose, and we're very mindful of that every day. We also recognise the importance of implementing housing redevelopment that's interlinked with economic and social regeneration. We can't separate any of these things out. It's our firm belief that good urban outcomes, well delivered with community support, will drive better social outcomes, and good social outcomes will drive better urban outcomes for the community and more widely for Auckland. In doing this, over the last 18 months, we've developed what we now call the neighbourhood approach. The neighbourhood approach is centred on the principle that the resident comes first and ensuring at all times we hold that social licence for the, comp the, the company to be able to operate effectively and do what it needs to do in leading, enabling and building capacity and capability for change. We do this actively and intentionally by providing residents ways to directly affect their neighbourhood's future. And I don't say that lightly. Um, we, un we seek to eliminate uncertainty and confusion that comes from lack of ongoing engagement. And many of you would be aware of 
the Northern GI um, uh, fiasco, could I say, um, disappointment, um, many words could describe it, um, and we can learn from that. But I think Northern GI, if anything, demonstrated what I would call not enough cups of tea. It's not just a matter of telling people that things are going to change and serving them a 90-day notice. You have to take people on the journey and understand their buy-in and get their buy-in. Um, and I think everybody, um, and Housing New Zealand would acknowledge that Northern GI was a less than satisfactory um, process um, and we're all working hard to retrofit the outcome. I think one of the things about the neighbourhood approach, it is about the neighbourhood. Community leaders from other parts of Tamaki and from other parts of the country might have a view, but it's the residents in the neighbourhood, that particular neighbourhood, who know the challenges they face and how they can better contribute to the change they want and the future that they want. It recognises that neighbourhoods are unique and that a one-size-fits-all approach probably runs the risk of fitting no one at all. As we roll across, as we work through um, the regeneration of Tamaki over the next couple of decades, it will be a neighbourhood by neighbourhood approach. Um, it won't be um, a one size fits all approach. Urban redevelopment is complex. It requires different arms of government and local government to work together. It requires them to work uh, with the community and it requires them to work with a multiplicity of um, of stakeholders across the NGO sector and the private sector. We will never, um, either on our own or with our partners, bring 16,000 current residents to a position of consensus. But we can and do seek to bring many to a position of agreeing what the best outcomes are for our community during these times of change. Things that are everybody agrees on are warm, dry houses, better and more quality housing, dealing with unemployment and safety concerns within our neighbourhoods, welcoming new families and businesses into the area, ensuring children get the best start in life through easy ECE participation, ensuring an effective pathway through education to employment or, or future study, and perhaps most importantly, a commitment we made up front which we call the Tamaki commitment, which is that no resident who lives in Tamaki now will be required to leave um, the area or their neighbourhood. So everybody who is in a house that might get redeveloped will be an, offered an alternative in the same neighbourhood within Tamaki and they will be part of the process of determining the future of that neighbourhood. Our best delivery partners are local community groups, local businesses, the local board, churches, people, businesses and so on. They are the people who do the heavy lifting for us. So we have our feet well and truly grounded and those people make sure we keep them grounded. And through that process, we have developed with the community what, I'm oh, sorry, I've gone too far, um, what we call the, um, the Tamaki way of working. Um, and that's a very collaborative, um, discursive process. I will talk just quickly, because I know I'm out of time, um, what a neighbourhood approach looks like on the ground. Um, in August this year, um, we la launched um, the first neighbourhood redevelopment project, regeneration project. Um, it's known around the traps as the Fenchurch One project. Um, our shareholders, um, represented by the Mayor and the Minister for Housing, turned up for that. Um, and I'd have to say they got a very different um, reception to the one they got 12 months before that. The Fenchurch Regeneration Project launched three projects um, at the same time that were all in the same neighbourhood. It included a new ECE centre and a local primary school. It took a decrepit dock hut that had been a centre for antisocial behaviour and considerable concern to the community and is turning that into a community hub for which the management and long-term um, responsibility will sit with that community. So that community is now challenged and responding to the challenge of how they organise themselves and set up a mechanism to manage that the reality of change, not just the promise of change. And it will also include 32 new homes um, on currently vacant sites, which allows us to move people progressively into new homes that are better fit for purpose, better suit their family needs or their circumstances in life, and then create new development spaces. Um, I think perhaps most importantly of all, um, 
this was the first, it is the first tangible outcome for the community where they can see their input turning into outcomes. And it's outcomes in which not only do they have skin in the game, but they have responsibility going forward. It's about capacity building and capability building in the community. When we first started working on Fenchurch, um, we had a bunch of experts in the room. There's quite a lot of experts, and some of the experts are in this room, or at least I know they're at this conference. And so we knew, we knew, that the number one problem we had to fix in Fenchurch was housing, until we, until we spoke to the community who actually told us that housing was number six on the things that needed to be fixed in their neighbourhood. And the things that needed to be fixed in their neighbourhood were things like safety and security, the dock hut, stormwater, because their houses actually flood in winter, and a couple of other things. And so now all those things are built into the neighbourhood regeneration plan for Fenchurch One. And we learnt a lot, the community learnt a lot, and we will continue to refine and adapt that process as we go forward. Um, I think if I kind of look forward about the next five years, because 25 years is a very long time to contemplate and far too long for me to contemplate, but I can contemplate the next five years. What we need to do is leverage the current goodwill and commitment of the community for change. It's critical that significant progress is made on all regeneration fronts within the next five years. It would be very easy, and I think one of the risks of this space and one of the risks of change is, if you sit in Wellington, and I know there are Wellington people here, incremental change looks a lot less risky than significant transformational change done fast. But my personal view is incremental change when you're trying to do transformation is guaranteed to fail, um, and the community won't wear it, and they don't want it. So we're about prioritising our, our projects, we're about um, identified, identifying um, and resourcing um, social and economic projects that will make a difference. We're about initiatives that will drive the Crown's focus on a better public service and lifting that to another level. And interestingly, we are in the throes of now negotiating through uh, contracts for outcomes across a multiplicity of agencies. Um, driven and coordinated by Treasury, which is a whole new way of doing things which hasn't been done before. And it's about a planned and phased approach to how we progressively re regenerate and renew not only the place, but the community and the options and choices the community has going forward. It's about executing a series of interlinking and complementary initiatives that will create the change we want. The role of TRC in all of this is not to do it. It's to recognise and manage the often competing and at times contradictory forces at play. It's hard to make, get the balance right. We cannot and should not and will not make key decisions that affect individual people's lives. The ways in which we go about doing our business relies heavily on influence, the in heavily on influencing the environment in which that person gets to make decisions and choices. What we do and how we go about implementing that can lead to an environment, hopefully, that is rich in opportunities or one which it imposes obstacles that limit choices an individual can make. Clearly, that's not our aim. We need to ensure that we go about doing what we do at a local level provides the widest and best opportunities and the least number of ob obstacles for the people and businesses that are there. We need to agree, and I reflected on the conversation yesterday, we need to agree on what is the right thing to do, and then our job is to marshal resources and processes to, to deliver. And it's our job to unblock blockages, remove obstacles to process, be a connector of capability and opportunity, um, not to do it all ourselves for people. Um, I guess in conclusion, um, we all have choices about the way we as a city, as a society achieve goals or determine outcomes. For greater community wellbeing, good choices are those that provide more opportunities and reduce the obstacles people face to making the choices they want. That's what we're about. The ability to make good choices will also build capabilities both for the individual and the wider community. And through that, supportive infrastructure and strong institutions and improve the social, economic and environmental well-being of society. And ultimately for us, the measure of the success for TRC as a company will be how soon it's no longer needed. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you.
Thank you, Martin. Um, a very interesting, um, again, uh, positive, I think, uh, aspects to the to the conversation and as I say uh, sort of uh, the whole community approach and it sort of made me think the procedural thoughts. Okay so um, now that we've moved from running a wee bit um, early this morning to now running a wee bit late this afternoon, um, Philippa would really like us to be able to take a couple of questions um, so um, we're going to, to do that um, and so if anyone has any, any questions bursting out please do um, step up and take the microphone and then when we've done a, a couple of questions or so we'll, we'll move through and have a, a small break before we then um, move into the workshops this afternoon. Um, so yes, yeah, so I feel sure there must be some questions out there to provide us with some feedback of, of what you thought about uh, uh, Philippa and Martin's talks this afternoon. Yeah, <laughs> you could talk to them over coffee, but um, you're very welcome to take the microphone and ask some Can questions. Can I just say one thing? I meant to um, acknowledge um, Judge Shona Kandadine, who's um, on our advisory committee, New Zealand Centre for Sustainable Cities, so that's already a palpable link which we really value. Any questions? So do you have any questions from the floor? No, you're all uh, <laughs> public health. Coffee, coffee. Need a coffee. Far be it from me to keep you from coffee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for <laughs> <laughs>